David and I met in ninth grade um, at Hammond High School in Alexandria, Virginia. It had been about 1960 or 61, right? And uh, we were going to the same school, and uh, I'm, I heard about this other guy that was painting, and I used to like to paint, and I met David, and, and it, it, uh, we became fast friends because we of that like interest. Although we were, we traveled in different circles. He was, uh, he was, uh, he became a treasurer of the student council. He was uh, joined fraternities, and he had his whole big life. And I was this sort of like quiet person, <laughs> but we had that common denominator, which was art. I did a little bit of work on Eraserhead. I played the Man in the Planet, and then uh, early on, David, that film he shot for over five years and had very little money. But when he first got to Los Angeles, uh, Allied Studios was going out of business and they were getting rid of their scene dock. So we rented a big truck, steak bed truck, went to uh, Allied Studios and they said, we can have anything we want for $100. Gave him $100, filled the truck up with flats of fireplaces and windows and doors and walls and took it over to the American Film Institute, which, is, which was at the Doheny Mansion and down in the stables, we stored all these flats. Well, for the next five years, David designed and built himself all the sets using the material that we gathered from uh, uh, allied artists. And if he didn't have something, he would just make it out of cardboard and paper. He, he loved to use uh, like a paper mache, phone books or anything. They just put some paste on it and create a wall. The first film I production designed with David was Straight Story. And uh, we shot that out in Iowa. Mary Sweeney had written the script with her friend. And I think she thought how great it'd be if Dave and I worked together on it. And we'd been kind of, our, kept our careers kind of separate in Hollywood. And I'd been working in design, art direction, and he'd been making films. And uh, we went out to Iowa and just had a blast. It was like, it was like a great reunion, but uh, realized how much I enjoyed working with David, or just being around him. After Straight Story, uh, I, I, uh, he called me for work on Mulholland Drive. And Mulholland Drive at the time was a TV show. And I go, well, that might be good. I'll just have sort of steady work for a few years. <laughs> I started working with David Lynch in, well, for David Lynch in about 91, I think. I uh, came in um, to shoot the episode portion of On the Air, which David had done the pilot for. And he was in the midst of post on Fire Walk With Me, and they had uh, committed to shoot six episodes. So I came in to shoot those six episodes with the various directors. Most of my inspiration came from Los Angeles and uh, in ho old Hollywood, you know, just the way we thought of it. I, I remember when we first came to California going up to Schwab's drugstore and you know the Hollywood sign at that time it was deteriorated uh, uh, the back lots of studios were so great and the back lots were kind of destroyed but we did the sound stage with all the painted backdrops and stuff you know I mean David used that to a great effect in in the scenes with Justin Los Angeles is a wealth of material I'm when we first started the people at uh, Disney I think it was Disney and ABC they were saying, well, can't you shoot this in Canada? You know, <laughs> Mulholland Drive. Los Angeles, through David's eyes, is, you know, it's sort of, Los Angeles is often sunny, as we know, but behind that sunny facade, a lot of dark things go on. I think that's sort of, you know, a recurring theme in David's work is sort of the facade versus what's really happening. So I think that the sunny part of of LA he enjoys because it doesn't give anything away. David loves, loves Los Angeles. He just, you know, he got there and just, he thrived and loves it. And, you know, I don't think he could ever live anywhere else. So he, it was a homage in a way to film in the city of Los Angeles. And I'm not trying to show you how to do the scene, but just watch me and I, I think you'll understand what I'm getting at. Hank. Going in, I knew that he knew the whole story. He, he knew shot by shot, because he wrote it, and he thought about every shot writing it. And 
do exactly what he wanted. Uh, we have a lot of reference points because we've known each other for so many years so that he goes, oh, you, you remember that corner of Philadelphia? And, <laughs> and I'll kind of remember what he's talking about. I mean, you certainly read the script and talk to him a little bit, mostly about uh, David, you know, I remember talking about specific scenes that he was going for, a, you know, an effect, photographic effect that he knew that uh, I would have to test, do some tests and prep. Um, but other than that, it was more about um, a mood and color and really nothing specific. I think David's uh, prep process is sort of like, I always equated to uh, gathering his box of paints and really not really giving out too much of what he's gonna do. In the scripts, you don't see the story. You know, when I look at it, I'm, I'm sort of seeing physicality, what, you know, okay, we need an apartment, we need a storefront, we need, you know, dentist's office, whatever. And, uh, and the other thing I learned is never to try and figure David out, you know, where he's going. We go early on with uh, Jack, the production designer, and location people, and we sort of narrow it down to, you know, what David wants, and we pick the locations. And then typically when you go out on the tech scout with the crew and sort of talk nuts and bolts of where things are, the director will point out, you know, where he's going to shoot, you know, where they're going to look, where the trucks can go, all that sort of stuff. But during the tech scout, David doesn't go. So I, that's sort of my job to say, well, we could look this way, or we could look that way, or we could look that way. So put all the trucks behind the building because anything could happen. With David, we're looking for interesting spaces. The courtyard for the apartment house we found just, you know, just driving and searching every courtyard. A lot of it's just a matter of doing preliminary searching, getting it down to a few places, going with David to those places, seeing which ones he responds to, responded to, and then either narrowing it down or going another direction, de depending on his reaction. It's unbelievable. <laughs> when we did Betty's aunt's apartment, because it was going to be a television show, uh, we uh, built a set. And then when the film was completed, we folded up the set and they stored it. And then ABC passed on the series. Those stupid people. <laughs> And then we went and unfolded the set and shot for another couple of weeks to turn this TV series into a feature film. You know, it was inspired by the old apartment buildings in Hollywood, or some of them are spectacular with the uh, fireplaces, uh, the carved wood, you know, on the doors. We did it, although I don't think you see it in the film. There was a flamingo sculpted into the fireplace. Uh, we had a lot of woods in there, books, uh, things that she would have collected over, over the years and uh, things that would have been fascinating to a young actress coming into Hollywood. To sort of see, oh, you, can, you, know, you won't always be eating hot dogs. One day you'll have a nice, comfortable existence. Diane's apartment, we went the other way. We found apartment, uh, even when we were building stuff, a lot of times we'd look for things, and we found a, the exterior and they were built early on. I think art directors designed all of them. They, they would so look sort of Disney-esque, you know, big wood beams and stuff, but they've, over the years, they've just gone down and down and, and they're kind of low, low uh, rent apartments. We, I remember painting that one blue just to make it a little more depressing. What do you want? David, uh, I think in the yeah. film, or at least in the print that I saw, had enriched a lot of the colors, so they were even more intense or more saturated than what they actually were. Adam's house was found by our location scout and David wanted everything minimal and pristine and looking at the valley because you have that scene where they climb up to the pool later and we found that house and used it pretty much as is. I built a dresser in the bedroom, you know, to sort of match with it, where he takes out the jewelry case. And uh, the people loved their house, of course, and we had to have that pink paint in there. They were scared to death. So we, we covered everything with a matte 
clear vinyl. So the, their stone floor, it, you can't see it on film, but it was all covered. The kitchen cabinets were all covered because uh, he had this fluorescent pink paint he was pouring on it. And it, we knew it was going to get all over, and we, we appealed to the owners that will know how to protect it. And I think in the end, we, we got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Winky's Diner was out near the airport, if I remember correctly, and we created the logo for Winky's. I think uh, David told me at one time he was at Denny's on Sunset, and it was at night, and he walked out near the trash bin, and some hobo came, came out, and it scared him. I mean, it really scared him. And I think that's one of those nucleus of ideas that became a part of this film. I just wanted to come here. To Winkies? This Winkies. Okay. Why this Winkies? The scene in the diner, David came to me and shortly before we shot it and said, uh, we were discussing in ways to make it more nervous, the camera more nervous, and we discussed maybe doing it handheld, but he thought that would be a little too jittery, a little too obvious, and maybe uh, a little distracting. So. We ended up with a very low tech, you know, it was like a six foot jib arm basically. And me operating the camera and just sort of floating around and nice and easy, nothing aggressive. And but they're both the same. I think, you know, we were shooting it and the way he was directing the performance, it was maybe 30% of what you see in the final film. Once he cuts it together, you know, I think, uh, it was edited in such a way that there were a lot of pauses in there that gave it a lot of weight. And of course, David's sound design just sort of propels it <laughs> into the weird zone. <laughs> the scene where they get in the cab, they're on Sunset Boulevard and uh, things are really starting to unravel. And David wanted to give it sort of this herky-jerky feeling. And, you know, we were there, we had all our gear there, and, and again, we talked about um, doing handheld. And he said, no, what if we just put the camera on the dolly and dolly right on the sidewalk? And I said, well, yeah, we can get some track and put the track down. He said, no, no track, just, just right on the sidewalk with the dolly. We sort of all looked at each other and said, oh, well, okay, we'll we can try that. And, and that's ultimately the shot you see in the film. Uh, the dolly, my dolly grip Tim was very upset because he thought it would look like just a mistake on his part. But I think that it's it's sort of so rough that you know it's not like oh there's a little bump in the track. It was like crazy rough, and I think that it um, you know it's just one of those things that you just go with David on, say okay let's do that, and then you know you go home that night going. What the hell? I hope that works. <laughs> Club Silencio was filmed in a theater downtown Los Angeles. And it, they have some wonderful theaters there. They, they've turned a lot of them into churches and uh, they rent them out to other functions. Some of them have been destroyed. You know, the, the scary thing about shooting in Los Angeles is you, I always feel there that well, this is the last year we could ever shoot this film because, you know, everything's changing. And it has changed a lot, especially downtown Los Angeles is changing. But that theater was, uh, had the right amount of deterioration. And uh, we painted the entrance outside, you know, it was in an alleyway. I remember uh, David called me, he said, Jack, we gotta paint this. And the film companies there shooting, they're getting ready to shoot and uh, so I went to uh, I went to the studio where we had our lockup of paint. Climbed over the the fence into the paint lockup. Got like ten gallons of paint. Uh, drove it out to the downtown L.A. and David and I like <laughs> painted the <laughs> the exterior of the theater. <laughs> There seems to be some problem with your credit cards. 
of the scene with uh, Cookie. That was shot at the same theater where we shot. And we hadn't planned to shoot it there. We, we were going to shoot it at a hotel in Hollywood. And David was shooting, and he saw this little room. And I'm out looking. I'm out getting the other location ready. I get this phone call. Jack, uh, David's found a place he wants to shoot here. And I'm getting, sort of getting the other location ready. And I go, what do you mean? So I went running back, and uh, he found that beautiful location and decided to shoot it right that day. Because we were going, you know, we were trying to find an unusual space. And uh, David, he's, he's got so much in his mind of, about what it's going to look like. But then if he sees something he likes even better, he just, he turns the cart and does that. So it worked out. Plus, I think it put him ahead of schedule. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Roke. We built a room for Mr. Roke, and that was built on a stage uh, at Paramount. And it was made out of red drapes, basically. David loves red drapes. So we put some carpet on the floor. We put up some tall drapes. I think they were like 20 feet tall in a sound stage. And then I built an opening with the glass panel. So he came through doors and looked into this, you know, sort of vast room of drapes. Uh, I built a desk in that room. There's not much furniture. There's a couch and a desk. And the desk was was created so his wheelchair would fit right in there and then come out. But he shot everything with his wheelchair independent of that. But uh, David, for some reason, loves red drapes. And if you're ever stuck with a set, just put up some red drapes. And <laughs> it's not going to work. You're playing a dangerous game here. You know what I want. It's not that difficult. Sort of the metaphor for uh, how David works, or maybe a metaphor for um, the power of the director, is in the movie where there's a scene where Betty and Betty's rehearsing for an audition. Get out. Get out before I call my dad. He trusts you. You're his best friend. This will be the end of everything. And then, you know, I don't know, a half hour later in the film, she goes to the audition. And it's halfway, I think, halfway through the audition for most people where they realize it's the same dialogue. But yet it's presented such an amazingly different way that, you know, it's sort of, I don't know, it's really fascinating. You're playing a dangerous game here. If you're trying to blackmail me, it's not going to the pilot versus the episodes, you know, we were sort of, we were only privy to the pilot. And if the episodes were on paper or not, we didn't really know. Uh, you know, we had a notion they were certainly in David's head and there were times shooting the pilot when we turned to David and, you know, ask him a question. Like, uh, I remember when we shot the scene with uh, Naomi, when she gets to her aunt's house and she's putting her things away and she's telling Rita how excited she is to be in Hollywood. Well, I couldn't afford a place like this in a million years. Unless, of course, I'm discovered and become a movie star. Well, of course, I'd rather be known as a great actress than a movie star. But, you know, sometimes people end up being both. So that is, I guess you'd say, sort of why I came here. And we were shooting that scene. It was so sort of bubbly and happy, especially for David, that, you know, we sort of turned to him between takes and said, bad things are going to happen to Betty, aren't there? And he wouldn't say a word. <laughs> but we used to tease him because we were trying to figure out where it was going to go. And just clearly it had to go <laughs> in a bad place. <laughs> you want me to make this easy for you? No. No fucking way. It's not going to be. It's not easy for me. Diane. It was unique working on because it, you sort of had to change, you know, change your mindset midway through. I mean, we shot the pilot, finished it, they turned it in, you know, that didn't go well. It, and then we thought, you know, that it's dead. It's no one's ever gonna see it, which was really sad. And then a year and a half later, it was sort of resurrected, which was great. And, you know, my, I was trying to think of 
how David was going to, you know, sort of conclude it because I think there was a real effort on his part in the pilot to start a lot of storylines to give himself somewhere to go, you know, season two, season three. And suddenly now a lot of those storylines had to be dropped and this had to sort of distill down into something into the third act. And I think that's sort of amazing that he was able to do that. This is the girl. You know, when you work with David, he's got the world in his head and you're making his world. So uh, working with David is a fine artist. He is different than working with most directors where they're looking for suggestions and ideas and, and uh, you're, you're presenting continually ways that the film could go. David knew exactly where the film was going. When I was uh, making Straight Story with him, he would show up and build on the set and paint. So we made him the on-set painter and gave him a paint kit and he took it with him. A friend of mine is doing uh, Twin Peaks with him, the new Twin Peaks, and uh, she said the other day, he said, I want a paint kit with me, and he gave her a list of all the stuff he wanted every day. And he's, he's uh, I remember we were in Iowa getting ready to shoot the uh, a scene with uh, Alvin Strait outside the house, and Dave was out there with a broom sweeping the street. He, he worked as a professional sweeper at one point in his life, so he's very good at it, and, uh, and he seems to enjoy it complex individual.